name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Uh, well, welcome to St. Lennox, to the parish of Lexton, whether you're here in the flesh or with us online. Today is a very auspicious day because it's the sixth Sunday after Trinity. Also, I gather there is a sporting event <coughs> later today. Um, some of you will be sick of it. I'm effectively an eight-year-old boy about the whole thing, and I'm in a grand state of excitement. And I hope, I hope that this might be a moment, whatever the outcome, where we can come together as a nation, not to boo people's anthems, which we mustn't do, or to take the mickey out of other people's children watching the football, which we mustn't do, but maybe, maybe, to join together in, in hope as a nation. So that's my naive statement for today. And if you're here in the flesh, you'll see that we put red and white bunting all over the pews to celebrate the event. Thank you very much to those who did the flowers this week, which are similarly inspiring. You'll be relieved to hear I'm not preaching today, so you're not yet going to get the Gareth Southgate sermon. We are here to worship God, who is Lord of all, and the loving Saviour, who is Lord of all nations and all peoples, and who brings all together. So we leave a few moments of stillness before we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, Before you offer your gift, Go be reconciled. As brothers and sisters in God's family, we come together to ask our Father for forgiveness. Most merciful God. Amen. The Lord enrich you with his grace and nourish you with his blessing. The Lord defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. The Lord accept your prayers and absolve you from your offences for the sake of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. We say together the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, you made us all in your image. May we discern you in all that we see and serve you in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're going to hear from Scripture. A 
awaiting for the wood of the prophet Amos. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to him, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, See, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very centre of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all these words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And then Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go free away to the land of Judah, earn your way there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, speak to God. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richness of his grace, as he lavished on us. In all in his wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him also, you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards the redemption as God's own people. If you're comfortable to, would you please stand for the gospel? baptizer has been raised from the dead and for this reason these these powers are at work in him but others said it is Elijah and others said it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old but when Herod heard of it he said John whom I beheaded has been raised for Herod himself had sent men who arrested John bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias his brother Philip's wife because Herod had married her for John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, 
knowing that he was righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the Baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with the orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Pray that I may speak in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please do be seated. To paraphrase Edmund Burke, bad things happen when good people do nothing. Herod really could have prevented the beheading of John the Baptist, should have. It's hard for us to believe that he didn't. He'd made a rash promise to his daughter, but when she asked for John's head, he could have told her that, that quite justifiably that she'd gone too far and he wasn't prepared to do such a dreadful thing. Perhaps even passed it off as a joke, told her to try again. Nobody would have blamed him. In fact, they might have admired his strength of character. But that wasn't how it seemed to him. He was so concerned for his own pre pressure, pre excuse me, precarious authority and about keeping his wife and daughter happy and afraid of losing face in front of all these guests, that he did nothing to stop a bad thing happening. And an innocent man died needlessly. Of course, I can tell myself that had I been there, I would have protested, that I would have stepped in and tried to stop it. But would I really? History is full of examples of good people, and I like to think that I tried to be a good person who allowed bad things to happen just because they didn't want to get involved. Would I really have had the courage to stand up and be counted for a man who had just allowed a death sentence to be handed out on a whim? Or would I have made sure that I kept my own head by keeping it down? I'm just glad that I wasn't there to be put to the test. I've recently had to complete my safeguarding training, which has to be updated every three years. The course is quite lengthy and comprehensive and includes hypothetical and real historical examples of cases where allegations of abuse were ignored, disbelieved or not taken seriously by people who were good people in positions of trust and authority. In order to protect themselves, these good people did nothing and as a result others suffered. Herod wasn't the nicest of people, but he wasn't particularly bad either, just weak and self-centered. He could have prevented a terrible tragedy, but he did nothing. Nevertheless, in the face of evil, grace and goodness did still prevail in John's faithful disciples, who did do something. They didn't respond to violence with violence, but neither did they do nothing. And like John offers lost, they came and took his body away for a dignified burial. And grace prevailed in Jesus too. John, who was not only his forerunner and herald, was also his cousin and had just been brutally and unjustly murdered. But Jesus didn't lose heart or hesitate in his mission. If anything, he stepped it up. John's death was perhaps a sign that things were moving on towards his own arrest and execution. So he continued traveling throughout the region, even in places where he encountered indifference or hostility. And he decided that now was the time to authorise and send out his disciples to preach and heal in his name. 
Jesus too was to, soon to face an unjust and violent death, but his disciples would be ready to go on afterwards preaching his gospel of grace and salvation. When Herod heard that Jesus was going around in the area attracting a big following, his guilty conscience got the better of him, and his reaction was that it must be John the Baptist come back from the dead to haunt him. Or perhaps he hoped to give him another chance. Herod had felt drawn to John, as we heard, and had secretly respected him. But rather than con confront his wife, he'd done nothing, and John and those who loved him suffered. Pontius Pilate would be the same. Not wanting to challenge and upset the people or lose their allegiance, he would allow them to condemn to death Jesus, a man he knew to be innocent. And in washing his hands, would convince himself that it wasn't him, it was the others. He was blameless, but he had done nothing, so Jesus suffered. And again, despite the injustice and horror of the crucifixion, still grace prevailed. Jesus' followers didn't react with violence, that wasn't their Lord's way. But they didn't like Jesus often do nothing either. They stayed beside him in his ordeal and then made sure his body was respectfully treated and carefully laid in a tomb worthy of a king. And later, they would go on to do a lot more. They would go out and preach and proclaim his story in the world, even though it was at risk to themselves. If public figures make bad decisions motivated by the desire to maintain their own position and popularity, and those decisions go unchallenged, then it isn't just they who are responsible if lives are damaged or lost. We are all responsible if we do nothing. I'll never be a politician charged with making the big decisions, but the decisions that I do make still have the potential to affect the lives of others. As Christians, we have a great advantage over Herod and Pilate. We live in these times after the death and resurrection of Jesus. We don't have to wonder what Jesus is up to as they do. As we heard this morning in St Paul's fervent and encouraging letter to the Ephesians, with all wisdom and insight, God has made known to us the mystery of his will. Paul reassures us and reminds us that before the foundation of the world, God chose us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that we've been chosen for God's favour while others haven't. He creates everyone in his own image and offers himself in Christ to everyone. As Paul writes, his grace is freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Paul calls it an inheritance. When we believe in Christ, we accept that inheritance and we commit to living in Christ, as he puts it. We have received with gratitude and humility the gift of his grace and have been baptised with his Holy Spirit. So Christ is woven into our lives. We choose whether to use that gift to live and work to his praise and glory. God made humankind out of his boundless love and for no other reason than to draw us to himself and into the eternal love which flows constantly through the Trinity. Each one of us is involved in God's plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Our purpose as the body of Christ is to manifest God in the world while we're here. We have his life and the decisions that he made recorded in the scriptures to inform and inspire our lives, and we have his Holy Spirit to sustain us and keep us connected to him. It may be, and it is likely, that he'll sometimes lead us on a path which we'd rather not take, but he is the signpost and the only direction we can rightly follow. God calls us, Paul calls us God's chosen, and as such we are entrusted with the responsibility to serve him love our brothers and sisters and cherish our, the world in, our, in his name. To stand by the belief which first inspired us and to use these beliefs for good. We will be tested but we've accepted Christ's commission to make him known in the world and to put the welfare of others before our own. It's a life which demands sacrifices which sometimes means we have to stand up and speak truth to power. But the way to our own true peace and fulfilment <coughs> is by being faithful to the trust invested in us by the Father who created us 
the Son who died for us, and the Spirit who lives in us. Amen. we remain seated, we affirm our faith using the words of the name. We believe in one Lord, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made known. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Almighty Father, in all our petitions, praises, and laments, we pray simply, may grace prevail. the swirling complexities of our time, we pray earnestly for those who have power and those who are in positions of responsibility. Give them with insight, wisdom, uphold and strengthen them. Inspire their advisors. Help us always not merely to uphold them in prayer, but to do what we can to work towards the common good that we see. In these forthcoming days of decisions and planning, we simply hold these things before your plan. We ask the grace will prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in any sort of need, or trouble, or infirmity. And among them, those who have asked for our prayers and are named on our pew sheet. Mary and Ashley, Jill and David, Jan, Tony, Shirley, Stella, Mandy, Lori, Betty, Sheila, Carol, Joan, Graham, Tim, Holly, Tony, 
Margaret, Owen, Jasmine, Kathy, Wynne, Frida and Ernest, Jean, Roy, John, John, Hill, Helen, Pam, Florence, Erin, Angus, Chris, Derek, Rosemary, Donna, and those many others known to us. We pray for the wholeness and reconciliation that comes in your Son. We pray for those who worry for them and pray for them also. We ask that grace will prevail. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Pray for the body of your Son, the Church in all the world. Pray especially for those parts of the body where to offer you worship uh, means to uh, put uh, ourselves into grave danger. We thank you for the opportunities that we have here in the parish of Lexton, for the people gathered at home and here, for gifts and enthusiasm all the solidarity we know, all these good things we know come from you and are received in order to be shared. Bless our bishops and archdeacons and all those in position of authority. They may lead us in faith, unity and compassion. Most of all, we pray that grace will prevail. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 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 We thank you that you made each of us for life in fullness. We thank you for the games, uh, leisure and sport that bring many joy. Today we give you thanks for those who find enjoyment in football and other sports. We pray that uh, if it be your will, this nation may be uh, drawn uh, together, not in selfish pride or arrogance, but through a shared experience and a rejoicing in one another. Bless all the nations of the world, and we pray and across the world. May grace prevail. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. We pray for the communion of saints, for those who now rest in your nearer presence, and among them Pauline, Teddy, Frank, Graham, Robin, Rod, all those others known to us. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you at home. Peace be with you at the back of the bus.
Let's uh, pray the prayer for the preparation of the table together. Being present, be present, Lord Jesus, our risen High Priest, make yourself known in the breaking of bread. Amen. If you're comfortable to, would you please stand? The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death, and so we gladly thank you, with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord, 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 Praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine are poured, and may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did in him. We plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all. Upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Leonard and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven through Christ and with Christ and in Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread. To share in the body of Christ, though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one
those who are, are watching at home and those who are unable to come forward and don't wish to receive the sacrament today. Uh, in a few moments you can pray the prayer of spiritual communion. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God.
Let us pray. God of our pilgrimage, you have led us to the living water. Refresh and sustain us as we go forward on our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, there are nine young people and two helpers making our first eleven, which is presently in the uh, church hall. Um, uh, one of my many, many regrets at the moment is we can't send out Junior Church and welcome them back. Junior Church is part of this act of worship. And I just delight and that they're able to gather and I give thanks to the many people that are continuing to help. I know we are all praying for them, but let's keep, keep, keep going. Um, children and their teachers are having an exciting time at the moment and we must um, pray uh, for, for them. Just delight that they are up the road there. And it won't be too long, I pray, before we can be back together here. Now, uh, we're still not entirely sure uh, what the future will bring. And my prayer is that we'll be able to enrich our worship uh, once again and simplify some of the things around our worship uh, in the coming weeks. But I just want today to speak to those who may be nervous about what happens next and to really assure you that you are the priority. You are the priority. And if whatever happens, um, I will make sure that we do uh, what we can to provide um, safe spaces for those who, who um, feel nervous at this time. So I go forward in, in hope and anticipation I look forward to discovering this week, and I pray for what may or may not be possible. But um, I just want to thank everybody for sticking with it, sticking with church, sticking with worship, with all the compromises and all the complexities. Um, it is a delight to me to see the numbers of us that are able to, to gather, whether it's online or here. We will move forward and we want to enrich our worship and sing if we can and use our whole body and senses to worship God. And we're going to balance that, of course, with making sure that those who are nervous know that God's love is for them as well. So please pray for us as we try and, uh, and make the right decisions over the, the coming days. And thank you. So, I hope that you have an excellent day, a particularly excellent day from 8 o'clock onwards. And I invite you to stand for God's blessing. Christ, the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for the sheep, draw you and all who hear his voice to be one flock within one fold. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.